Good evening and welcome to the live stream Bible study of the Abundant Love Church. I am Pastor Gary Bush. Thank you for tuning in this evening as we come together to praise the Lord and to study his word. Jesus declared in Matthew 4 and 4 that man doesn't live by bread alone, but he lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we come together to study God's word so that we can not only be fed, but we can grow thereby. So we're going to sing a couple of songs. We'll have a word of prayer, a few announcements, and then we'll go into our study for this evening. Zion is calling me to a higher place of praise. Yes, to a higher place of praise. If you know it, sing it with us. It goes like this. Zion is calling me to a higher place of praise to stand upon the mountain and to magnify his name to tell all the people every nation that he reigns Zion pick it up he's calling me to a higher place of praise. Zion is calling me to a higher place of praise. Stand upon the mountain and to magnify his name. To tell all the people and every nation that he reigns. Zion is calling me to a higher place of praise. One more time. Zion is calling me to a higher place of praise. Stand upon the mountain and to magnify Every nation that he reigns, Zion is calling me, Zion is calling me, Zion is calling me, Zion is calling me, Zion is calling me. Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for this day, and we thank you for this opportunity to come into the house of prayer, to make known our petitions. We thank you, Father, that we can come boldly before the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and grace in the time of need. We thank you, Father, for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all unrighteousness and tears down the middle wall of petition between man and God. Thank you, Father, that we can have fellowship and communion again. Thank you that in this season we celebrate as Christmas. There is peace on earth. There is goodwill from God towards men. We thank you that you loved us enough to send Jesus to die. We thank Jesus for loving us enough to give up his life that we would have a right standing with God. We thank you for the institution and the organism of the church that allows baptized believers in Christ to come together to worship, to praise, and to fellowship, to have communion with one another. We thank you, Father, for the oneness of your spirit. We thank you for the glory of your name. We thank you for the power that you give. We thank you, Father, for all that comes daily, Lord, 
rewarding us with benefits. And we thank you, Father. There's no God like you. There's no God beside you. You are God alone. You are God all by yourself. And so we recognize you as the only true and living God. You are the maker, the creator of heaven and earth. You are Alpha. You are Omega. You are the first and the last. You're the beginning and the end. Father, we praise you and we give you glory here in this place today. We pray your presence here among us. Come and fill the room with your glory. Fill the room with your presence. Help us to feel the power of the Lord upon us in the name of Jesus. You said that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So strengthen us today. Strengthen us where we're weak. Build us where we've been torn down in Jesus' name. Open the eyes that we may see and discern what the will of the Lord is. Open our hearts so that we would understand your word. You said that wisdom is the principal thing and to get wisdom, but with all of our getting, we're to get understanding. So Father, send your word this evening and then Lord, help us to understand, not just understand it, but to accept it, receive it, and to grow by it. In the name of Jesus, we pray for this great nation, this nation that is called by your name. We pray for our president, our sitting president, we pray, oh God, that you would give him wisdom, that you would surround him with holy and wise counsel to make decisions that would not only bless this nation, but that would cause the saints of God to live a peaceable life. You said that we are to pray for men in authority, that we can live a peaceful life. And so we pray, oh God, your hand upon him, upon the Senate and the Congress, the House of Representatives that help to govern this great nation. We pray, oh God. For the Supreme Court that has very difficult decisions to make in these coming days, we pray the counsel of God upon them. Then, Father, we pray for every church that is open in your name. We pray the anointing of God in their midst. We pray the power of God on the man of God that will break open the bread of life. Even this evening, Lord, bless this one that will teach and we will love you and thank you and praise you and give your name glory. We ask it all in the matchless and in the mighty name of Jesus Christ and the Lord's people said, thank God. Amen. 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 And amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I feel like giving God the glory because he's been so good to me. Goes like this. Oh, I feel like giving God the glory. All the glory. All the glory. I feel like giving God the glory. He has been so good to me. Oh, I feel like giving God the glory. All the glory. All the glory. Oh, I feel like giving God the glory. He has been so good to me so good so good so good so good so good he's been so good he has been so good to me he's been so good so good he's been so good been so good, so good, so good. He has been so good to me. Oh, watch it. Oh, bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus.
Just a couple more weeks here. We've got a week here before uh, or so before Christmas, and then we have a week before the new year. And you can't wait till the new year gets here, amen, to start making plans. You gotta start making plans early. And you gotta make preparations, preparations. You gotta prepare in advance. And so uh, before our announcer comes, I'm going to throw an announcement in here uh, on the first Sunday in the new year. That's going to be January 2nd, 2022. We are opening our worship services again for regular participation. And so we're calling all family, calling all members, calling all friends. Amen. We want to come together and be the unified body of Christ on January 2nd. Now, even though we're coming together to worship together as a family, we are still going to observe social distancing and we will wear our mask in protective uh, preparation to keep people as healthy as possible, amen? Even with the mask and with the separation, we still can't guarantee that you won't get sick, but we can guarantee that the healer for your sickness is here. The Bible say he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement that brought our peace was upon him, and by his strife, with his stripes, amen, we are healed. So we're going to come together January the 2nd, and we're going to have a high time in the Lord. I'm looking for the Lord to do great things for us in this coming new year. Amen? I don't know if you make New Year's resolutions, but if you do make New Year's resolutions, uh, you should think thoughtfully about them and make the kind of resolutions that not only will do you good, but that the Lord will be pleased with. And there are some resolutions that you made that you need to just continue into the new year. And one of them is being a witness for the Lord. We want to be a better witness in 2022 than we were in 2021. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. At this time, we're going to call for the announcer. Amen. The announcements this evening will be brought to us by Sister Natasha Hilliard. Would you all receive Natasha Hilliard with a hearty amen. Amen. Good evening. Good evening. Um, as Pastor stated, on the first of the year, we will open up our live streams for everyone. Our live streams are open now uh, while observing social distancing, face mask guidelines, and the temperature checks. The children's department will have their Christmas program December the 19th, this Sunday coming up. Please come out and support our children. Pastor will be casting the 2022 vision uh, on Sunday the 26th. Please come out and uh, be aware of what's going on for next year's uh, calendar. Our sick and recovery, uh, Philip Johnson, Travion Hilliard. We have uh, many ways to contribute uh, or to give tithes or your offering. 
You can use Cash App. Our Cash App is Abundant Love Church, capital A, capital L, capital C. Um, you can give uh, mobily through Giveify. Our name on there is Abundant Love Church. You can mail your contribution in. Our mailing address is P.O. Box 6577, Fort Wayne, Indiana, 46896. Or you can drop it off here at the church. Our address is 2615 New Haven Avenue. Um, if you can join us in regular services, our live streams are open again. Our live stream times are Sunday. We have Sunday school at 9.30 a.m. We have our morning worship at 11 a.m. And on Wednesdays, we have our Disciples Academy Bible study at 6.30. Um, if you're not able to make those, then um, all of our streams are archived. You can find us at uh, Facebook at Abundant Love Church. Um, on our YouTube channel, AL Ministries, capital A, capital L. Um, and then we also have our motiva Motivating Moments video on Mondays uh, on our Facebook page. These are all of our announcements. Enjoy your evening. All right, let the church say amen again. Amen. All right, keep those announcements in mind. Again, we're coming together. The Bible says that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. So it's been a challenging year this last year, just the stream. Uh, for those of you that are watching at home but from other states, we will continue to stream. Amen. So if you've been accustomed uh, to watching our streams, you can still get our streams. Those streams, of course, are available on the Abundant Love Facebook page. You can also find them posted and archived on the YouTube channel AL Ministries. That's capital A, capital L Ministries. And I'll tell you what would be a good idea if you just become a subscriber the next time you look and you subscribe to the AL Ministries YouTube page and you'll get notifications when we post new videos. Amen? Amen. All right, one more song here. I'm gonna inquire a little help for this song. Amen. Those of you all that know it, sing it with us. I'm so glad trouble don't last always. How many know trouble don't last always? Aren't you glad trouble doesn't last always? If trouble lasted always, we'd always be in trouble. But because it doesn't last always, it endures for a night, the joy comes in the morning. I'm so glad the late, great Reverend Timothy Wright goes like this. I'm so glad trouble don't last away. I'm so glad trouble don't last always. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I'm so glad.
Sometimes when you still have to make progress, you have to move when the light isn't there. Sometimes things happen beyond your control. Sometimes you shed a tear. Sometimes your pillow is wet over in the night. But the Bible says joy will come in the morning. Amen. And the whining saying, I can feel the break of the day way down in my soul. And so that's what you want to do. You want to wait patiently on the Lord until the day breaks. And when the day breaks, the Lord will show himself strong in your behalf. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. God bless you. We want to go right into our study for this evening. Our theme for the month of December is a God-sent gift. And we found that theme in the book at Galatians chapter number four, and we have verses four through seven. I'm going to read that in your hearings, and I'm going to read it from the King James Version, that's Galatians, fourth chapter, verses four, five, six, and seven. I'll give you a chance to find it in your Bible, or find it on your tablet, or find it on your phone, however you find it, let's look at the word of the Lord together, amen? Galatians 4 and 4 reads like this. It says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, 
Number five says to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Verse number six says, and because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Number seven says, wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. May the Lord bless his word. You may be seated. Our theme again for this month is a God sent gift. And here in the month of December, we are fastly approaching. We're a week or so uh, away from Christmas Day. And for the past few weeks and some even for the past few months, have been searching feverishly, trying to find the perfect gift for that desired person in this season. It's been more difficult this year uh, because of the supply chain difficulty and because of the inflation of prices. Um, you know, we've had to be wiser with our particular finances this year, but we still have in our heart the desire to give to people. And we don't just want to give them anything. We want to give them a gift that suits them, a gift that fits them, and a gift that adequately represents us. Because every gift you give not only goes to evoke joy and happiness in the receiver, but it should be a representation of the giver. In other words, the passion and the affection of the giver should be represented in the gift that's given. Amen? Amen. Some people say it's not just the gift, but it's the thought that counts. But the thought doesn't come from the gift. The thought comes from the giver. And so uh, in this Christmas season, we got it honest because we are chips off the old block. We give because God gave. One scripture says we love God because he loved us first. And the reason we give is because God gave to us first. And so this is the season where people are giving. Uh, they're going to great length to, to locate and acquire what they consider to be the perfect gift. They're searching multiple stores, searching online, uh, even making gifts to make sure they have the proper gift. But in James 1.17, the Bible says that every good gift and every perfect gift Precedes from above. It comes from above, comes from the Father of lights, and with the Father, the Heavenly Father, there's no variableness and there's no shadow of turning with Him. And so we see that God is a giver of gifts. And truly, when we look at the gift that God gave here in this Christmas season, God spared no expense, He spared no pains, He went all out to give us the best and the most perfect gift of this particular season. And so uh, as we examine our scripture, uh, Galatians 4, 4 through 7, we found three points. Uh, there are more than three, but we only derived three for our teaching purposes this month. We looked in verse number four, and we seen where it says, when the fullness of time had come, and so we said that God has perfect timing. And then later on in verse number four, it says God sent forth his son. And his son is the perfect gift. So at the perfect time, God sent the perfect gift. And that gift that he sent us enables us not just to be sons of God, but we are heirs of God. That is, we have an inheritance because we are sons and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. And so God not only had perfect timing, he gave the perfect gift, and the gift perfectly fit us. It's a perfect fit on us. And so on last week, uh, we talked about the fullness of time, and we talked about sending things at the proper time. The fullness of time means that he sent it at the right time. And uh, for those of you all that cook, you know, sometimes if you prepare dishes, um, something for people to eat, you want to make sure that it comes out fully cooked at its most delectable and most delicious time. 
Amen. You do not want it brown on the outside and raw on the inside. Yeah. Or you don't want to overcook it so instead of being moist and juicy, it's tough and dry. So you don't want to undercook it. You don't want to overcook it. You want to make sure that it comes just at the right time so the taste is at its pinnacle and at its zenith. And that's the way the timing is for God. God didn't want to send Jesus too early, certainly didn't want to send Jesus too late, but in the annals of time, God positioned the appearance and the, the accepted advent of the Son of God, and when the fullness of time had come, not a moment before, not a moment too late, according to God's heavenly uh, calendar and schedule, he sent Jesus at just the right time. I don't really... We went over it last week. I really don't have time to go into it tonight because I want to get to point number two. But if you read the book of Matthew, you'll understand how Jesus was sent at just the right time for all of the scriptures to be fulfilled. Amen. As you search the book of Matthew, you'll find various places where, where it will say, as was spoken by the prophet. And what it meant, it meant that somebody, some prophet prophesied before Jesus came and Jesus had to come just at the right time to make sure that all of those prophecies came to pass. Uh, not only uh, uh, those prophetic words, but it became Jesus to fulfill all prophecy. He said to John the Baptist, it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. I have to do everything that God said I would do. And so... Uh, he's born in Bethlehem, just like the prophet says that uh, Bethlehem would be the birthplace of, of the king. Uh, he had to be called a Nazarene. So for him to be called a Nazarene, Herod had to drive him into Nazareth. And so there are just, just, just a lot of scriptures. And, and if he had come at any other time, some of those scriptures would not have been able to be fulfilled. But just at the prime, you know, at the prime time, at the proper time, Jesus is sent, and he's sent because every good and perfect gift comes from God, and everything God does is good, and it is perfect. So his timing absolutely uh, is perfect. And then it says when that fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, and we see that God gave or sent his son as the perfect gift. And so that's what we want to uh, deal with tonight or next week we'll deal with how the gift fits us but right tonight uh, I want to talk about the perfect gift because Jesus is just that Jesus is the perfect gift he is the absolute best gift of God and so um, again I want to uh, just read this verse in your hearing it's James 1 17 it says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And so one of the things we find out about God in James 1.17 is that he's a giver. Now, two things you have to have to be a giver. First of all, you have to have a gift. You have to have something to give. You can't be a giver if you don't have something to give. And then number two, you have to have benevolence in your heart. You have to have feeling. You have to have compassion. You have to have a will that you can surrender to release something. Because when you give something, not sell, not barter, not bargain, when you give something, you take something that is your own possession and of your own free will, you relinquish possession of it into the possession of another. In other words, something that belonged to you, you release it so that it can belong to someone else. Jesus belonged to heaven. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. Jesus was with God in the beginning of it all. He belonged to heaven. He is the darling of heaven. But God released Jesus, sent his son, the Bible says in St. John 3.16, that whoever believes in Jesus should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so 
God releases Jesus, and Jesus, as the gift of God, watch this, is a good and perfect gift. Okay. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. So every gift that God gives is good and perfect. Jesus is good and perfect. Okay, what do you mean Jesus is good and perfect? Jesus is good, and the word good means beneficial and profitable. Things are good for you and good to you when they bring benefit to you, when they bring profit to you, when their coming allows you to have more than you would have had without it. So Jesus not only comes as the gift of God, but he's profitable to us. There are things that we gain by Jesus' coming. There are things that we benefit from in Jesus' coming. Amen? All right, incidentally, I didn't mention this, but if you have a question or if you have a comment or something you would like for us uh, to address, if you put it in the comments towards the end of the program, I will ask for those questions and we will certainly address your questions because sometimes, uh, uh, you know, we get to talking so fast that we, you may have a question that we haven't addressed. And in the coming year, in 2022, uh, we are making preparations right now to make our Bible study and our Sunday school interactive. That is, if you're watching by stream, you still have an opportunity to participate in the Sunday school. You can submit a question. That question will be seen. That question will be read. And that question will be addressed. Amen? Amen. 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 So, so uh, every good and perfect gift, or I was, comes from above. So Jesus is a good, he's a beneficial gift. How is he good to us? Well, Jesus represents the holiness of God. He's God in the flesh, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of God's person, Jesus came down and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, the Bible says, as the only begotten of the Father. And so he's full of grace, he's full of truth, and he represents the holiness of God. Not just the holiness of God. Jesus represents the righteousness of God. God is a just and he is a righteous God. And Jesus comes as the righteous representative of God. And then certainly last but not least, he's a sinless representative of God. He done no evil and there was no guile found in his mouth. The Bible says in Hebrews that Jesus was tempted in every point, yet without sin. He did not sin because he had the nature of God in him. And so Jesus coming, to, uh, coming into our life, we get good benefit from Jesus Christ. What kind of benefit do we get? Well, just the same ones I mentioned to you. Because he's holy, we receive Jesus, and we have the opportunity to be holy. The Bible tells us to be holy in all manner of conversation. But that can only be done through receiving Jesus Christ. And what happens when the blood of Jesus covers us, when God looks at us, he doesn't see what we've done wrong, but he sees the blood of Jesus that pays for what we've done wrong. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So the blood causes us to have a holy standing with God. He said, I, the Lord your God, am holy. Therefore, be you, be ye holy, rather, in all manner of conversation. And so that holiness comes through Christ Jesus. Number two, we are righteous through Jesus Christ. It's an imputed righteousness. We're not righteous in and of ourselves. The Bible says there's none righteous. No, not one. On our own, there's nobody who can stand before God and say, I'm righteous. But through the blood of Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death, the Bible said, whosoever will, let him come. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart. Believe what? That God raised deep Jesus from the dead after paying for your sins, the Bible says you shall be saved. And to be saved means that you've been declared righteous in front of a righteous God. It means that the handwriting of the ordinances, all the transgressions and the things that were against you have been blotted out 
and you walk in newness of life, and that newness of life is a righteous stand before God. The Bible says that we are the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. So it doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter what you, you know, where you've been, what you've been involved in, once you profess and confess Jesus Christ and accept him in your heart, it's just like taking an eraser and just, you know, going over the top and not, you know, um, children today, they don't know much about that. But uh, back in our day, uh, there were blackboards in the classrooms. And the teacher would use the, the, the um, chalkboard, the blackboard, all day long. And they had erasers up there. But when the eraser got full of chalk dust, and then you, you know, you'd go over the board, but the board would be so, so dusty uh, that it was like you wouldn't, you know, like you really didn't erase it good. But you know what? If you had the unfortunate task of maybe talking out in class too much, they would make you stay after and clean the blackboard. And when you clean the blackboard, it wasn't just, you know, going and erasing the blackboard. You had to go in, first of all, you had to take the erasers and you had to pound them together and get all the dust out of them. Then, once you got all the dust out of them, then you went over to the board and then they would get you a wet rag. And you would go over the blackboard and, and everything that had been written on the chalkboard for that particular day, after you went over it with it and dried it, nothing that was written on there could be read again because it had been wiped away, blotted away. And that's what the Lord does with our sins. The Bible says that the books are there. He records our deeds in the book, whether they be good or bad. But when you are under the blood of Jesus Christ, he will take it and he will wipe away every sin, every transgression that you have ever committed. And then you stand before God with a clean slate. And so Jesus does us good. He makes us holy. He lets us become the righteousness of God. And then we have the opportunity to walk under the blood of Jesus without sin. Amen. Amen. So he's good for us. Jesus is beneficial for us. When Christ comes into a life, he makes the life better than it was before Christ appeared. St. John 10 and 10 said that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I am come that you would have life, not just life, but that you would have life more abundantly. You would have life better than uh, the life you had before Jesus came. And so it's a good and a perfect gift. Okay, Jesus is not only good, Jesus is perfect. What do you mean perfect? This tense of the word perfect means complete. It means whole. In other words, it means self-contained. It doesn't need anything outside of it to help it and make it what it is. And it's sufficient to do what it's designed to do. So Jesus Christ is perfect, not just flawless because he comes from God, but he doesn't need anything else to help him be who he is or do what he's designed to do. He's perfect. He's total. He's complete. There's a big, there's a big drive now for what are called whole foods. And whole foods are the kind of foods that have basically everything included with it. You don't need to add anything to it, uh, uh, you know, to make it as nutritious as it needs to be. Uh, a lot of fruits and vegetables, you don't have to add any, you know, uh, you don't have to add any, any, you know, no salt, no pepper, no seasoning. You don't have to add any condiments to it because it is whole and complete by itself. And complete, it is able to nourish the body. And so... Uh, Jesus Christ is complete. He doesn't need anything added to him to be the son of God. He's the son of God because he's the declared son of God and he's God in the flesh. And as the son of God, he doesn't need anything to perform what he came to do. In other words, God equipped him to do whatever he sent him to do. He didn't have to have any help all he needed to do was obey the instructions of his father and follow directions. And by following God's direction, he did exactly what God designed him to do. In fact, in the book of Psalm, it says uh, that God had not taken pleasure anymore 
in the animal sacrifice of the temple. And so he says, thou hast prepared me a body, and lo, I come, here it is, in the volume of the book, whatever is written of me in the Bible, to do thy will, O God. And so when Jesus came, Jesus had a road map. Jesus knew what God had said about him, knew what the scripture said about him, and he went about doing the will of God according to the word of God, just like saints today. That's why it's very necessary for you to read the Bible. That's, I'm going to get in a little trouble here, but that's okay. That's why it's necessary for you not only just to read the Bible, but it's necessary for you to get in the teaching sessions of your church so that you can be infused with knowledge and understanding. Wisdom is good, good wisdom. But the Bible says, and with all thy getting, with everything you get, get understanding. What is understanding? Knowledge of the holy is understanding. So it's your knowledge of God and what the word says about God that will benefit you. And when you have the word of God, it's a complete package. Listen, when you receive the gospel of Christ, you don't need anything added for you to be saved. Paul ran into a lot of trouble with the Judaizers because after people had received Christ, then they tried to come along and say, well, you need to keep the law. You need to do this. You need to do that. And, and, and Paul said, no, we're not saved by works. We're saved by faith and we're saved by grace. And so the word of God is total and complete. And you know, uh, you got these people running around now talking about, well, you only got part of the Bible. What about the lost books of the Bible? What about this book? What about the Apocrypha? Well, let me tell you this. Uh, uh, we got enough to be saved. Okay. We, we, there, there might be some books that we don't have. And, and the Bible even talks about it. Uh, Paul talks about a, a, a letter that he wrote to a church that we don't seem to be able to locate and find. And, and so it is possible that there is more truth, but we have enough in our canon that if we read and obey, it'll not only show us who God is and who Christ is, it'll take us to heaven. Amen? Amen. That That is the plan, right? That's the goal. That's the target. The target is to get to heaven. Amen? Not to know all the Bible because you can study all night long and there's still going to be something about God you don't know. Job said, can thou by searching find out the almighty unto perfection? The answer is no. If God put all his knowledge about you in your head, he'll bust your head wide open. It's too much for you to contain. Too much, too much, too much. Amen. Paul, uh, you know, I think it was Festus or, or uh, looked at Paul and said, much learning made you mad, made you crazy, but uh, it's not just knowing facts, it's knowing who Jesus is. Yeah. And when we know who he is and what his work is, it works good in our life. And so he's not just good for us, he's perfect. He's total. You don't need to add anything, you don't need to take anything away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, you shouldn't do it because the Bible says we're not authorized to add and we're not authorized to take anything away from the scriptures. Paul said, if an angel from heaven or anybody else come and preach to you any other gospel than what I have preached, let him be a curse. God takes very, very, very seriously when people misuse and mishandle the word of God. God said what he meant. He meant what he said. And you'll do good not to say any more than God has said. I'll give you a quote from the late Bishop John T. Dupree. I don't think I'll ever forget it, and it's a very wise saying. He says, just stick to the Bible and don't add anything to it. He said, an attempt to be wise above that which is written is not wise. One more time. An attempt to be wise above that which is written is not wise. It's not wise to try to know more than what the Bible says. It's enough to know what the Bible says. Jesus said it like this. He said, it's enough for you to be as your master. You don't need to supersede your master. Just mimic him. Do what he has shown. The Bible says it doesn't appear what we're going to be like, but we know this much. We're going to be like him because 
we're going to see him as he is. And so he's the perfect gift. Why is he the perfect gift? Because he's good, he's beneficial to every life he gets in, and he's perfect. He contains the total will, the total knowledge of God. It pleased God that within Christ to let all the fullness of the Godhead dwell in him bodily. So he's the perfect gift. Another thing about the perfect gift is the perfect gift is good for the giver and it's good for the receiver. Okay. The perfect gift not only is good for the person who receives it, the perfect gift is good for the person who gives it. When the perfect gift is given, not only is the receiver pleased and satisfied, the giver is pleased and satisfied. And here's the thing about Jesus. Jesus was the perfect gift for both realms. He was the perfect gift from heaven, and he was the perfect gift in the earth realm. He adequately represented God, no shortcoming. In fact, he told Thomas, he said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am the perfect representation of who God is. So he's the perfect representation of God and he's the perfect representation of man that's in need of a Savior. You all hear me? Okay, listen at this. Okay, In the nation of Israel, there were three people that God dealt with to lead the nation. You had the king, you had the priest, and you had the prophet. The king was the figurehead of the nation. That is, he was the designated leader of the nation. The priest was man's representative to God. The prophet was God's representative to the people. It took three people. It took a king to lead the nation because, you know, to lead the nation, uh, you had to focus in on the people. To represent the people, you had to pay attention to God's instructions so that you didn't go in the Holy of Holies and they pull you out with bells and a, and, and a rope. You had to make sure you had to do business. You can't think about the people. You got to think about, about you when it comes time to do your priestly duty. And then the prophet didn't have time to mingle with the people. He had to stay in the presence of God so that he didn't misrepresent God to the people. And what Jesus did, Jesus combined them all into one office. He's not a priest after the order of Levi or the Mosaic law, but he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is the king priest that Abraham meets out of Salem, Jerusalem, after he slaughtered the five kings. And this Melchizedek is a king priest. And he's not just a king priest, he's a king prophet priest because he's the king of that particular uh, province and kingdom. He is the representative of God to the people, and he's the representative of the people to God. That's what Jesus was. Jesus is king of kings, lord of lords. He's the representative of God. He's the express image of God's person. And then all throughout the book of Mark, he is called the son of man. So he's the, he's the ultimate middleman. He adequately represents God, and he adequately represents people. He's a mediator. And as a mediator, he knows what God requires. He knows what man is able to do. And where there's any gap in it, Jesus bridges the gap so that we can have fellowship with God again. When Adam sinned, he broke our communion and broke our fellowship with God. Not that God didn't want to fellowship with us, but God cannot fellowship with sin. And so God's holiness kept us from God. God loved us but couldn't get to us because his holiness would have destroyed us and you never destroy people you love. And so he stays away from us until Jesus can bridge the gap between us. Bridges. Jesus is touched with our infirmities yet without sin. And so God can touch Jesus. We can touch Jesus. And in so doing, we have fellowship again with the Father. Amen. Here it is in the Christmas story. It's in what the angels sang. And so you, the Bible says that shepherds are in the field. They're keeping their flocks by night. And it says suddenly uh, the heavenly host appears and it says to the shepherds, fear not, I bring you tidings of great joy, 
For unto you this day in the city of David is born a Savior, Christ the Lord. You're going to find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger. And in, in all of it, it says, peace on earth and good will towards men. You know where the good will came from? The good will came from God. It's his desire to do us good. And that good is bringing peace between us. So the unapproachable God becomes approachable by us again. Amen? Amen. Have you ever seen people that were so uh, powerful that you were afraid to approach them? Sometimes, sometimes people, uh, movie stars and politicians, leave people in awe and so that, you know, sometimes they're not able to approach them. But it is a very a humbling experience when somebody of great stature will come down to your level and make your, you know, make themselves known to you. And that's what the Lord was. Listen, anytime the presence of the Lord come in this room, everybody should be on their face because of his greatness and his glory. But he's the kind of God, he's the kind of Savior that can be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. Listen, there is nothing you experience that Jesus doesn't know exactly how you feel. Jesus said, we don't have a high priest who can't be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. The Bible said, listen, when you feel weak, Jesus knows what it's like to feel weak. When you feel embarrassed, Jesus knows what it's like. To, doesn't he know what it feels like to be embarrassed, to be stripped, to be beaten, to be convicted as a criminal? And then to make him really look bad, hanging between thieves? We say birds of a feather flock together. And some people thought he was an unrighteous man simply because he was hung with thieves. And so he understands shame. He understands frustration. He understands, yes, he understands frustration. He told his disciples on many occasions, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me. That's frustration. He's saying, haven't you learned this by now? Okay, Jesus has been in every place we have been, but he's without sin. He learned how to depend on God, and then Hebrews finishes that verse by saying, therefore he's able to secure. That word secure means he's able to help anybody who's be temp being tempted in any particular situation. I'll say this and close with this. The Bible says there's no temptation taking you. There's nothing you can come up against except such as common to man. That means you may feel like you're the only person going through it, but the truth of the matter is somebody been through it. What you're going through right now, somebody else has been through it. The thing that you are crying about now, somebody just came through and they shouting and kicking up the heels, looking back at the heels, saying I made it over. So there's no temptation taking you except such as common to man. I love this. I love this part. He said God is faithful. That means he's not wishy-washy. There's no variableness with him. There is no respect of person with him. That means if he does it for you, he'll do it for me. God is faithful. He is so faithful. Watch this. Are you ready? You need to drink water. You need to drink water to swallow this. If you need to swallow this, because this is going to help you. The Bible says, he will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. That means every test and every temptation you get, God has measured you before you get it and say, oh yeah, you can take that. Come on, I, I did not, didn't I tell you? You need to drink water to swallow that? Oh, I didn't have it up to here. Oh, I can't go no further. I'm just, I'm just done. I'm just, that's it. That's not what the Bible says about you. The Bible says God won't put any more on you than you're able to bear. And the Bible says certain things you're supposed to be strengthened in lest you faint and be wearied in your mind. And so sometimes it's not that you're strong, not that you're not strong enough to do it, it's that you fainted in your mind. You stop trying. But the Bible says that if you persevere, that God will bring you out victoriously. Amen. God won't suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. That's why 
Hezekiah Walker sang the song, said he knows how much he can bear. Okay. But watch this. Will with the temptation provide a means of escape that you should be able to stand. Now watch this. That means every time God gave you a temptation and a test, he gave you a way of escape with it. I, I, I'm not making it up. That's what the book says. The book says, will with the temptation provide a means of escape that you may be able to stand. That means he's giving you no alternative for failure. That means anything you go through, he's giving you what it takes to come out and be a winner. Amen? I'll tell you what it's like. It's like, it's like, you know, you know those puzzles where, uh, you know, it's, it's a maze, really. And you got to figure out where the exit is, that's where your temptation is. Sometimes the exit is not so apparent. And sometimes it takes some doing for you to find your way out of it. But you can be assured there's a way out. So God gives you these temptations, and he has given you the perfect gift. He gave you the perfect representation of God, and he gave you the perfect representation of man so that you can do what the Lord has designed you to do. Amen. Amen. So he sent the perfect gift. He sent it at the perfect time. And that perfect gift at the perfect time is just what we need. What we need, rather, for our situation. Amen? All right. Clap your hands right there. Amen. I'm going to check and see if there are any questions, any comments. Okay, there are no questions. Now, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to make comments. Um, if you want to make your comments anonymously, um, you can send your questions to AbundantLove at Frontier.com. Those are all lowercase, AbundantLove at Frontier, F-R-O-N-T-I-E-R, Frontier.com. And if you don't want uh, your question to be seen in the comments, then you can send it to us by email. We will gladly address your question, amen? Amen. Because we want you to understand, we want you to know what the word of the Lord says and what the will of God is, Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in this evening. We're going to have a word of prayer here, and we're going to finish on this evening. Father, uh, we're taught and always to give you thanks, and we thank you this evening for the word of the Lord. We thank you that the word has come forth with understanding, and so, Father, help us not just to receive this word, but to take it into our hearts, hide it in our hearts, that we might not sin against thee. We pray that in this Christmas season, we rebuke the spirit of greed, we rebuke the spirit of frustration and depression, and we loose the joy of the Lord, the goodwill towards men, that you love us and you send Jesus, the precious gift for our salvation. Now look on us and bless us, strengthen and encourage us. We shall forever give your name thanks and praise when the Lord's people said, thank God. Amen. amen and amen. God bless you.